Hello, Lindsay Sturton here. In this video, I am going to talk about my research into the public service in Jamaica and in the wider Caribbean. This video was originally made for students of Law and Development, an optional third year module at the University of Sussex. It accompanies a seminar for which I have set reading of several articles and book chapters that I wrote with Martin Lodge, my long-time and some would also say long-suffering co-author on my Caribbean work. The reason I made this video was to offer a way into what I recognise are at times challenging readings. I am well aware that my research is in places quite theoretical and that it spans a period of nearly 200 years in the history of a country that many of you will not be particularly familiar with. So my goal in making this video is to explain a bit about the motivation and background to my Caribbean research and to explain some of the key questions and theoretical concepts and ideas that I have made use of. I hope that, having watched the video, we'll find the readings more accessible. Of course, you may have questions as you make your way through the readings, and you can always ask me. The topic of colonial constitutional, administrative and legal institutions in the Caribbean is something that I have been thinking about and writing about for more than 20 years now. In the late 1990s, I was a young lecturer at the University of the West Indies at Mona. This was in Jamaica, a country I soon gained a lot of affection for. My interest in the topic began when I got into discussion with my students there about their disappointment in Jamaica's progress since independence in 1962 and the reasons that lay behind Jamaica's relatively poor economic and other performance. Let me give an example. By way of illustration, in the 1960s, Jamaica's per capita income was about the same as Singapore's. But by the 2000s, Singapore's per capita was 12 times that of Jamaica's. Incidentally, Jamaica's economic performance has got a lot better over the last 10 years or so, but this does not subtract from the overall picture I have painted. Now, I know, as did my students back then, that per capita income was a very crude measure of social progress. But even broader measures of progress don't completely ignore GDP, and the difference between Jamaica and Singapore in this regard was overwhelming. Our discussions touched on various matters. Political leadership, the different policies adopted by the two main political parties in Jamaica compared with Singapore. But one thing that kept coming up was the extent to which the pattern of constitutional, administrative and legal institutions established during the colonial era has also set a context the pattern for the development and reform of governing arrangements in the post-colonial era. Among my students at the time, many were convinced that the disappointing performance of the Jamaican government in the post-independence era since the 1960s was the lasting effect of institutional patterns of governance established in the colonial era. But they were never very precise about what features of colonial governance were to blame and often vague about what these features were. At the time, I had no good answers to these challenging questions. I knew about and was a little sceptical of the literature on legal origins associated with Raphael Laporta on the better performance of economies that had been colonised by the British compared to those that were colonised by the French, Spanish, Portuguese and the Dutch. Laporta and his co-authors' explanation for this was that common law was better at protecting property rights and thus more effective at encouraging productive investment in people and physical capital. But in any case, both Jamaica and Singapore had been part of the British Empire. And so it was difficult to see how crude accounts of legal origins could explain the difference in performance between these two countries. What about the legacy of slavery, which impacted the two colonies very differently? There might be something in this, I said. Slavery in the British West Indies ended in the 1830s, 
but the plantation system through which sugar production was organised did not. I later came across Darren Ashimoglu and James Robinson's distinction between extractive and inclusive economic institutions. Extractive economic institutions function so as to facilitate the transfer of wealth to a privileged elite within the colonial society and ultimately from the colony to the metropole. Inclusive institutions, by contrast, encourage the development of more complex market relations by protecting property rights more widely and by providing political checks and balances by incorporating a broad range of groups into political and economic decision making. But again, my intuition was that an effective state, one that had the capacity for effective policy formulation and implementation, was just as desirable as one that was restrained from giving in to its more predatory impulses. I should say at this point that it was not that I thought that my students were wrong as regards the big picture. It was just that I wasn't satisfied to remain at the level of the big picture. I wanted to drill down in order to say something about how and why particular constitutional, administrative and legal arrangements established in the pre-independence era had been found insufficient to the development challenges of an independent Jamaica. A first big breakthrough for me came in thinking about the interplay between formal and informal institutions. Formal institutions are things like laws, procedures and rules by which government operates, the law of the books as we sometimes refer to it. Informal institutions, on the other hand, are the mostly unwritten norms, conventions and practices that surround these formal rules. And the law in action usually depends on a combination of the law of the books as well as these informal institutions. Could it be that while the pre-independence era had seen the transfer of formal institutions of responsible and representative government to the colonies, this had not been accompanied, and indeed it could not easily be accompanied by the transfer of complementary informal institutions. That, it turns out, was part of the story, but it was by no means the whole of it. The second big breakthrough came with reading Christopher Hood and Martin Lodge's 2006 book, The Politics of Public Service Bargains. These authors see relationships within government as based on a partly formal but mainly informal bargain between politicians and civil servants. Theirs is a sophisticated account of the relationship between public servants and the wider political system that they argue is constituted by a mix of formalised and implicit understandings about the loyalty and competence owed by public servants to those they serve. But their work has a long prehistory, some of which I will talk about now. A good starting point in thinking about this prehistory is a 1948 book by Leslie Lipson called The Politics of Equality. Lipson was a New Zealander and he was describing the political institutions of his native New Zealand that would be later characterised by Aksham Oglu and Robinson as inclusive. Discussing New Zealand's Public Service Act of 1912, he says, With the political parties, the modern civil service has struck a mutually beneficial bargain. By guaranteeing to public servants a life's career and a pension, the parties have forsworn the use of patronage and have guaranteed to the state's employees their tenure of their jobs. In return, the parties expect, and the public servants owe, equal loyalty to any government which the party have placed in office. I found this passage hugely suggestive about the preconditions for effective government and policy making for development. Lipson suggested that the emergence of a machinery of government capable of supporting effective political decision making depended on a peculiar combination of formal and informal institutions amounting, in Lipson's words, to a mutually beneficial bargain in which the civil service supported the policies of the government of the day 
in return for security of tenure. And you could see how a number of other benefits could follow from this. Without fear of losing their jobs or the need to seek political patronage, officials were free to cultivate the objectivity and neutrality and the long institutional memory required to support effective policy making. Here we have the conditions for the emergence of state machinery that have the potential to think beyond extractive policies and to become an engine of development. And to me, this mutually beneficial bargain was what was lacking in Jamaica's institutional inheritance. Jamaica never quite managed to combine the formal institutions of government with the supporting informal institutions that were necessary to create governmental structures conducive to effective state-led development. Instead, what had developed was what Martin Lodge and I, in a recent article in the Northern Ireland Legal Quarterly, characterised as a kind of mutually suspicious bargain. In other words, certain understandings underpinning the machinery of state emerge, but trust is lacking both on the part of the political leadership as it emerged in the years before and after independence, and on the part of the bureaucrats themselves. Let me talk briefly about events in the 1970s in Jamaica. I want to concentrate on this period for now, because this was the period in which the constitutional relationships that we're talking about were subject to maximum stress. And it is under such stresses that we can see most clearly how well constitutional arrangements hold up. The 1970s were an era of polarisation in Jamaican politics and society. You can see this in popular writing on Jamaica, such as Marlon James's novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, which I urge any of you who enjoy good fiction to read. But to explain briefly now, after 1972, the more left-wing of the two political parties, the People's National Party, under the leadership of Michael Manley, embarked on a programme of transformation of Jamaican society. In doing so, it was guided by an ideology that, after 1974, they called democratic socialism. Manley was an early advocate of third world solidarity, what would we would these days call South-South cooperation. The rival Jamaica Labour Party was suspicious of these developments and advocated more cautious policies of mixed economy development. The backdrop against which these rivalries played out was the Cold War, and the United States became alarmed at Manley's friendship with the Cuban communist leader Fidel Castro. Meanwhile, the Jamaica Labour Party became increasingly pro-American in its outlook. My concern here is not with the sphere of international politics or even with the ideological orientation of the political parties. Rather, it is with the stresses that this caused in the machinery of government and more broadly in the constitutional arena. Jamaica had inherited the British model of a permanent civil service, a supposedly neutral body of officers responsible for executing the policies of the government of the day. And this had worked more or less as it was supposed to during the immediate post-independent years of the 1960s. But in the polarised political environment of the 1970s, the fragility of Jamaica's constitutional arrangements and the absence of supporting informal institutions became evident. Many civil servants were irreconcilable to democratic socialism, and they may even have been correct in their assessment of the merits of that ideology and the associated policies. But in an effectively functioning government, it is the responsibility of the civil service to implement the decisions of government. And this was what was envisaged by Jamaica's Westminster style constitution. Just to pin things down legally, section 69.2 of the Jamaican constitution says that the cabinet will be the principal instrument of policy and shall be charged with the general direction and control of the government of Jamaica 
and shall be collectively responsible therefore to Parliament. So the question was, would the civil service see itself, as Lipson suggested of the New Zealand civil service, as owing equal loyalty to Manley's government as it had to its Jamaica Labour Party predecessor? Because if it didn't, that is a kind of a coup, not an armed coup, but a subversion of the policies of the democratically elected government by unelected bureaucrats. In fact, some of the public administration scholarship of the time speaks of the emergence of certain enemy relationships leading to acts of political terrorism and administrative sabotage developing between politicians and civil servants. In other words, they see fault lying on both sides. Let me give you an example of what I think we are talking about here. This is an anecdote that I got from someone who had served in Prime Minister Manley's office. Manley wanted to ameliorate urban unemployment in the capital city of Kingston. And to this end, he wanted to use public funds to pay young unemployed men to undertake city beautification, cleaning up litter, sweeping the pavements, that kind of sweet thing. And so Manley, along with this official, attended a meeting with the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance. Manley outlined his scheme only to be met with outright refusal. The idea is repugnant to me, said the permanent secretary, and it will not happen. That was perhaps an extreme example of outright refusal, but for Manley it must have been symbolic of a larger issue. Now, you might think that the permanent secretary on this occasion was correct, that this was a profligate use of public funds, or what I think might more likely have been his concern, that it could be seen as a blatant act of political patronage to shore up electoral support in key constituencies. But there's a bigger issue at stake, and that concerns the question, what happens next? What would a political leader with an electoral mandate for radical reform do if the civil service refuses to carry out their wishes faithfully, raising questions, of course, and warning of the consequences of ill-considered decisions, but ultimately carrying out the wishes of the political directorate. In fact, there was a prescient report on the civil service in Jamaica, prepared by the United Nations Technical De Assistance Department in 1965, shortly after independence. The review praised Jamaica's strong, uncorrupt civil service, which was, it said, a national asset of incalculable and fundamental value. Nonetheless, the resulting report warned of an existential threat to the Jamaica civil service if the service was unable or unwilling to be responsive to the policies of the government of the day. The report went on. If this concept cannot be substantially realised in practice, ministers will inevitably be faced with the temptation to press for the appointment to positions of responsibility in the civil service of people who will in fact carry out their policies and plans because of membership in the same political party or because they appear to the minister to be more responsive to their own thinking and more active in seeing that things happen. People will be sought who are prepared to be wholeheartedly involved in implementing the policy of the government of the day. It is the essence of democracy that the will of the people expressed through the government of the day should be carried out effectively economically and promptly, and if a permanent career civil service cannot do it, then other kinds of executive instruments must be developed. And this was exactly what happened next. Faced with a civil service that proved unwilling or unable to carry out the policies of democratic socialism, the administration of Michael Manley sought other means of implementing its agenda. A number of approaches were taken, but I will mention two principal ones here 
because both had profound consequences for the development of the Jamaican state. First, the government, Manley and his cabinet, increasingly built up and relied upon for the implementation of its policies, a patchwork of boards and commissions that were outside the formal control of government departments, but which were comprised of political appointees who were sympathetic to the aims of Manley's PNP administration. This had the advantage, from Manley's point of view, of creating a semi-autonomous area of government outside the control of the civil service and constraints, yet tied to the political process. But equally, as Manley himself acknowledged, it had the effect of fragmenting government service unnecessarily, leading to uncoordinated policy implementation across different sectors. There was also a tendency of these boards over time to show the same resistance to political direction from the top as the line ministries had done. In other words, they became bureaucracies in their own right. A second strategy for implementing policy outside civil service structures was the use of technical consultants or special advisors. These were ideologically committed technical analysts brought in from the universities or from the private sector to provide an alternative to the civil service's conventional monopoly on advice to ministers. This was in fact a British innovation, introduced to the UK by Harold Wilson. But in the Jamaica of the 1970s it was taken to new lengths. Special advisers were appointed by and accountable solely to the minister most important, as a PNP party document put it, these cadres should not be integrated to the regular system. They must work outside of it. Well, you can imagine the kind of clash of cultures that might result when liberal civil servants, respectably dressed in suits and ties, were approached by radical university lecturers in sandals and knitted tams. And there was indeed a clash of culture between these irregulars, as they were known, and the established civil service. Well, you can imagine the kind of clash of cultures that might result when liberal civil servants, respectably dressed in suits and ties, were approached by radical university lecturers in sandals and knitted tams, demanding, not asking for information and data and that kind of thing. And there was indeed a clash of culture between these irregulars, as they were known, and the established civil service. Nonetheless, the, the literature seems to suggest that these irregulars were somewhat successful in harnessing the state apparatus to the developmental policies of the PNP. It might also be remarked that many of these young technical advisors went on to have prominent careers later on in the Jamaica public service. The problem, however, with these sort of strategies, particularly the first one, though, is that the attempt to circumvent the absence of an effective machinery of government, rather than to foster effective capacity for policy making and implementation within government itself. Both strategies can be seen as attempts to work around the problem of the mutual suspicion between politicians and civil servants, rather than to solve the root problem. And this, in conclusion, brings me back to my starting point, the colonial origins of this lack of trust between politicians and civil servants. It turns out that my UWE students were right. It just took me 20 years to realise why. 20 years of drilling down have led me to this conclusion, that the lack of trust between elected politicians and unelected bureaucrats was built into the institutions of colonial government, and it has been hard for the state in independence to escape from this structure. You will have to read what I have to say in my articles and chapters to get into all the details. But the punchline is this. Colonial institutions were designed to be unresponsive to local political demands. In part, this was done with the best intentions, the local electorate before universal suffrage in the 1930s 
was dominated by the interests of planters and the merchant classes and was seen by the colonial office in London as incapable of governing in an inclusive way. So Jamaican constitutional institutions before independence were designed so as to give colonial bureaucracy under direction of the governor appointed by the colonial office in London, the final say in all important matters of policy. And this bureaucratic control over policy was given up only very reluctantly after the legitimacy of these arrangements was utterly destroyed as a result of the widespread riots and disturbances in the 1930s. And even when it was given up, the public service at first struggled to adapt to an environment in which they were expected to be responsive to the demands of a new elite comprising elected politicians. And any emerging norms of political neutrality were tested to destruction when the views of the bureaucracy diverged from those of the political leaderships in the polarising environment of the 1970s. I have deliberately tried to take a long view on these developments because they were a long time in the making and because they cast a long shadow, one from which Jamaica is only now recovering. I am also aware that in this mini lecture, I have only really scratched the surface of the events and developments that I am talking about. I don't imagine that this brief talk has turned you into experts into colonial constitutional and administrative legal doctrine in the Caribbean. What I hope you have gained is a way in so that you can now approach the literature as a critically informed reader. And on that note, I will see you in class. For now, goodbye.